Welcome to Henry AI Labs. This video is going to explain how the deep convolutional generative adversarial network works. The primary idea to the DC GAN compared to original generative adversarial network models such as the multi-layer perceptron GAN is that it adds upsampling convolutional layers between the input vector z and the output image in the generator. In addition, in the discriminator, it uses uh, convolutional layers like a regular convolutional neural network to classify the generated and real images as the corresponding label real or fake. So the inspiration that the authors had uh, for the DC GANs around the time of this publication is the all convolutional met and eliminating fully connected layers on top of convolutional layers. So the idea was that instead of having these operations like uh, max pooling and average pooling, which are like these uh, two by two kernels that just kind of like group the statistics of pixels together and decrease, decrease the uh, spatial resolution by a factor of two. So like a 32 by 32 image is processed into a 16 by 16 through these pooling functions. These are a really popular foundation of the convolutional networks. They're in papers like uh, the ELINet and the AlexNet. So another idea is batch normalization. And batch normalization takes a vector of features or it could be a, you know, a matrix and it normalizes them so that they have some the same parameter mean and another parameter for the standard deviation. So just like a standard uh, multivariate Gaussian is how the features in the layers of a neural network are distributed. But another idea that they use is they build on the ReLU activation with the leaky ReLU, which has a little negative slope. And there's another video on the ReLU variance that will be provided in the description of this video. So these are some of the architectural guidelines that they present in their paper, which we've just discussed, but. It just says, uh, replace the pooling layers with convolutions, use batch normalization in the generator and the discriminator, but they have a specific thing where they say, uh, don't use batch normalization like right as the input to the generator and something right before the output to the discriminator. To get a better sense of this, uh, you should probably read the exact details of the paper. And then they, uh, they take away the hidden layer, the fully connected layers, which are kind of like the multi-layer perceptron layers, and then they use uh, the ReLU in the generator and they use the leaky ReLU in the discriminator. So here are some of the more uh, fine-grained training details. So in their pre-processing, they scale it to the from the original pixels and images go from 0 to 255. This is like white to black. And then the RGB is the combinations of these 0 to 255. So they scale all these down to minus 1 to 1 to accommodate the tan H activation function. Contrastingly, if it was like a sigmoid activation function, they'd be scaled down to be between 0 and 1. So then another detail is they use a mini batch size of 128. So this is a really important thing to consider uh, with respect to the memory on your GPU and what kind of uh, training rig you have for this kind of thing. So in their case, they're using 64 by 64 images at by three because of the RGB. So they're putting uh, each of those tensors 128 by 64 by 64 by three. And then they'd usually do like evenly distributed on real uh, fake. So it'd be like 256 by 64 by 64 by 3 is going into the GPU at each, uh, you know, at each epoch of the training. So then again, they uh, initialize their weights with a normal distribution, zero mean, standard deviation is 0 0.2. The leaky ReLU comes with a parameter and they use 0 0.2. And so then another interesting thing in deep learning is hyperparameter tuning on these uh, like surface level parameters, like the learning rate and the momentum term used with the atom optimizer. So the data set they test this on is on LSUN, which is these bedroom images, and they've got over 3 million training examples, which is a lot and definitely could contribute to the success of this. So another cool thing they do is the deduplication algorithm. So what an autoencoder does is it takes an input, compresses it into a low dimensional representation, and then reconstructs the input. So what they do is they see if images in the data set have a real, really similar, like low dimensional representation from the autoencoder. And by doing this technique, they're able to remove 275,000 images from the 3 million training samples because they don't want to have uh, uh, samples in the data set that are too close to each other because they think the generator will just mode collapse to that uh, point in space. So these are the results on the LSUN 64 by 64 uh, bedroom images. So another cool idea that they look into is unsupervised feature learning with GANs. And there are a lot of methods for uh, unsupervised feature learning where you have an enormous data set, but you don't want to label it because labeling data is, takes a lot of time. It's expensive. So some, some ways of doing this are the autoencoders that we just talked about, as well as a technique called exemplar CNN, which still beats the DC GAN on unsupervised feature learning. But this table shows how all the classic unsupervised learning methods uh, perform on this task of feature learning. So another cool idea in the DC GAN paper 
is walking in the latent space. And what they want to do is they want to be able to control what the GAN outputs by manipulating that input Z vector. So they generate a bunch of the images and they record the uh, Z vectors that produce them. And then they average these Z vectors together and then they perform this kind of vector addition with the intermediate representation, I meant the, not the intermediate, the uh, input representations, like these uh, randomly sampled input vectors. So thanks for watching this video on DC GANs. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs.